Hi, this is Paul, and this is Rough Draft for Sunday, where I run through the current edition of my Sunday sermon. There was a Democratic candidate debate this week. The Iowa caucuses are just a few weeks away, and the news organizations are all over this. But the, what got the big attention from this debate is the question of who's lying. Now, I didn't know much about this. It's, it would seem sort of crazy to me to imagine Bernie Sanders would have told Elizabeth Warren in December of 2018 that a woman couldn't win the presidency, but apparently there was a meeting, and at least according to CNN, four different people heard this conversation between Warren and Sanders, yet right in the middle of the debate they got into the question of whether Sanders said this or Sanders believed this, and other people talked about whether this serves Warren's candidacy to separate from her, even though they sort of had a, a, a truce that they, they both being sort of at the progressive end of the spectrum in terms of the candidates didn't want to fight each other, and here they're having the basically a really messy fight over this, calling each other a liar. And this, of course, is in the midst of a campaign where everyone wants to differentiate themselves from the current holder of office who is known for his uh, relationship with the truth. Essentially what's happening is there's sort of a purity race here that, that they, want to, they want to show themselves more pure, more connected to the truth, more trustworthy than the others. That's, in a sense, part of what goes on in a race, but, but quite naturally in, in such a complex world, it all depends on purity with respect to what? Now, I've, I've mentioned in a previous sermon a number of months ago that in, in some ways the two political parties in the United States sort of represent two different political archetypes. In the run-up to the 2016 election with all these Republican candidates, I, when I was watching the debates, I noticed that each one wanted to be stronger than the other. Each one was going to be tougher on immigrants and tougher on crime and tougher on, you know, bigger, badder, more... Uh, spending for defense spending that's that's sort of the that's sort of the republican thing the democrats are kindness and they're going to um, give more or do more for less fortunate for for people of 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 lower means and so on and so forth and so they compete for this and so that's sort of where sanders and warren over at the far end of the spectrum are you know, Sanders just today said she'd, with the stroke of a pen, cancel all student debts. And, you know, now there's debate as, as to whether or not she could do this. And so expect, um, well, that was Warren, expect Sanders to come out, although they'll all be busy with the impeachment hearings for the next little while. But this goes on and on and on. If you remember the George W. campaign years ago, he was going to be a, it was going to be a compassionate conservative. In some ways, he, he wanted to sort of merge the archetypes into one. Barack Obama, you know, winning in terms of the, the kindness party, um, he had quite a few, um, quite a few strikes from predator missiles. Uh, the Obama administration in many ways followed the foreign policy of the Bush administration. And we're still in Afghanistan, even through all three presidents. And, and so, you know, but, but each of them tries to portray themselves as one thing because that's what their particular corner elects. Now, now, this is very, very difficult because as everyone knows, well, you actually need to make compromises, which co sort of chafes our desire for purity. You need both kindness and strength, and, and you have to try to pull this all together. This week on Twitter, someone I'd made a comment about the, the English royals because I've been following the the Netflix series The Crown and I've been following the new drama in the royals and so some, someone asked me I still don't understand the whole Queen Parliament no king but princes thing um, it's all quite confusing um, anyone have a historical reading on how this system came to be well, I didn't really answer his question but why this system is sort of like this look at how Americans split on when uh, look at look at how Americans split on whether they want the president of the United States to be a role model to embody to embody some ideals that sort of being mode, 
or an executive who goes to work, that sort of doing mode. And you see these tensions in these, these political campaigns because we want them to be a certain thing or do a certain thing. And so, you know, we had George W. Bush sort of responding to the, the Clinton sex allegations and people saying, oh, he's going to restore dignity to the White House. And and George W. Bush seemed to be a very faithful family man, and Barack Obama seemed to be a very faithful family man, and no stories of affairs or anything like that. And then, of course, we have what we have today. And 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 so what you see is that to, to pull all of these things together is really difficult, and to talk about these things is really difficult, because life is very complex. And so when it comes right down to picking a president of the United States... Pretty much everyone is making compromises and thinking, well, I'll, I'll vote them in for this, but I don't really like that. And this is sort of the way we live. Now, last week we looked at the baptism of Jesus, and we're going to hop over to a different gospel this week and pick up John the Baptist speaking freely in the gospel of John. And John the Baptist says something here that for many of us, we've grown so accustomed to it, we barely notice. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was so that he might be revealed to Israel. And we talked about that last week. And for you YouTubers, I forgot to turn the camera on last week, so I don't have a YouTube version of last week's sermon. I, I didn't think the I didn't think the rough draft went particularly well, but the, the final draft went quite a bit better, but it's only on the church Facebook page. So if you're really looking to see it, you can find church Facebook page. Then John came, then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him, and I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The one on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who I will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. The next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look! the Lamb of God. That's twice. It's twice in just a few verses. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Wow, that's pretty dramatic results to a very strange phrase. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying. Is that really all they wanted? And they spent the day with him. Ah, that's what they wanted. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard that John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which, when translated, is Peter. Now, 2,000 years of famili familiarity has washed away the strangeness of this idea of the Lamb of God, and barely a Christmas can go by, and I don't hear Handel's Behold the Lamb of God just, just ringing in my ears. Lamb of God, Lamb of God. Oh, that's Jesus. Jesus is the Lamb of God. But do we ever pause and say, what on earth does that phrase mean? Last week, we, we saw John the Baptist, and John the Baptist is almost a John Brown figure in, in the New Testament. He comes on the scene, and he's bigger than life. Now, unlike John Brown, who did a whole bunch of heinous, bloody things, I, I read a biography of John Brown last year, and very, very interesting guy, right in the middle of Kansas, bloody Kansas, and he, he almost launches the, um, the Civil War early, and by, a, you know, trying to take over an armory, a really botched job, and the the US the US commander of the forces that captured him was none other than Robert E. Lee, a few years before the Civil War would start, and he hands this prophetic note to um at his, at the time of his execution that, you know, basically only by blood will this land be washed free of its sins. And 
John the Baptist comes on the scene and he has everybody's attention, sort of like John Brown in this mural in the in the Kansas in the Kansas State Legislature. Bigger than life, bolder than life, apocalypse, you know, wars, death, everything. God is coming. You'd better get ready. And then he says, Look, the Lamb of God. Now, most of us who live in cities don't have a lot of experience with lambs, but there's a lamb. There's a picture. And you look at these two pictures next to each other and you say, Lamb? Lamb of God? What on earth could that be referring to? Lambs? Well, there's, there's lambs in the book of Exodus and they get killed and their blood is splattered on the doorposts to hold back the, the angel of death. Is, is, is Jesus going to be the Lamb of God? This is a very, very strange thing to say. But really, this picture that we see of John the Baptist bigger than life and a little lamb and the preaching that John says this, this lamb will do, well, really what we're trying to take is our two images together. And of course, the, the spotless lamb that has to be, well, the Jews didn't really consider the, the lamb in Exodus to be a sacrifice because it wasn't really technically sacrificed on an official altar, but many ways each of those lambs gave their lives for the for the children of Israel. And that gets commemorated then in the Passover festival with sort of a sacrifice. And so that's very much the purity, but but strength? How can purity and strength meet? Now, Tim Keller in his book, Making Sense of God, pulls this together basically by borrowing from Jonathan Edwards in a, in a, in a really profound passage that some of you might recognize because I, it's one of these stock things I pull up fairly regularly. Particularly impressive to readers over the centuries has been what one writer has called the admirable conjunction of diverse excellencies in Jesus Christ. Well, that sounds sort of strange. Well, that's Jonathan Edwards' talk. Admirable conjunction of diverse excellencies in Jesus Christ. That is, in him, we see qualities and virtues we would ordinarily consider incompatible in the same person. We would never think that they could be combined, but because they are, they are strikingly beautiful. Jesus combines high majesty with the greatest humility. He joins the strongest commitment to justice with an astonishing mercy and grace. And he reveals a transcendent self-sufficiency and yet entire trust and reliance upon his heavenly Father. We are surprised to see tenderness without any weakness, boldness without any harshness, humility without any uncertainty. Indeed, accompanied by a towering confidence, readers can discover for themselves this unbending convictions, but complete approachability. His insistence on truth, but always bathed in love. His power without insensitivity, integrity without rigidity, passion without prejudice. I can't say it any better than Tim Keller does right there. Because we see these things and we think, how can they come together? Well, well, well where, does, where does, does this ferocity come from? Well, many scholars have noted the, the second century B.C. book called the Testament of the Patriarchs. And this was, a, this was written somewhere around the second B.C. And it was intended to be sort of a... And you might think of it as fan fiction of the Old Testament, where each of the, the patriarchs, sort of like you see in, in the end of the book of, of Exodus, when Jacob sort of gives his closing remarks at the end of his life, offering out blesses and kind of, you know, other words that aren't so nice to his sons. Well, this carries on where each then of his sons does it in kind. And it's, it's full of moral, it's four of, it's, it's full of moral commandments, basically, the book is. But there's a strange passage in it, and, and this book is highly debated because the book tended to get, as what happened in the ancient world, books would get copied, but then sometimes when they'd get copied, they'd get illuminated and changed. And so this book, which was a Jewish creation, sort of got picked up by by Christians. And, and so, you know, there's a lot of debate in terms of especially this particular passage and the Testament of Joseph, but this is what it says. And I saw in the midst of the horns a virgin, 
wearing a many-colored garment, and from her went forth a lamb, and on his right, as it were, a lion, see, and all the beasts and all the reptiles rushed against him, and the lamb overcame them and destroyed them. And again, it's amazing how often Monty Python sort of pulls all this in. You had this scene in the Monty Python and the Holy Grail of this of this terror bunny. And, and this picture, this, apoc this apocalyptic picture almost looks that strange because all of these beasts and reptiles all rush against a lamb and the lamb overcomes them. And you think, lambs don't over overcome beasts. And the bulls rejoiced because of him. And the cow and the hearts exalted themselves with them. And these things must come to pass in their season. And do ye, my children, honor Levi and Judah, for from them shall arise the salvation of Israel. So there's a, there's a lot of debate as to whether, well, maybe Christians put this in later, or, or, or what was this before. But what's clear is that the ideas are here. And, and the idea is that all of these animals take on a lamb and none can put it down. But, but how can that be? But that is exactly the picture we're seeing here of Jesus. John expects Jesus to come out like a lion and dominate the field, but he comes out as a lamb and they all pile on him. And in fact, they kill him. And that's how he conquers. Now, how does that kind of conquering work? Now, to take away the sin of the world is also probably a phrase that your mind jumped to in a certain reference, but if I pull open some questions with it, you'll notice it's also sort of has this discordant excellency ambiguity built into it. How might a lamb take away the sin of the world? Purify through the shedding of the blood of sinners? That seemed to be more of what John the Baptist was considering with the axe laid to the root of the tree. Purify through shedding the blood of a substitute. That's more lamb as, as sacrificial substitute. Purify by the reformation of people's hearts and lives. That's much more the image of seeing the lamb and seeing what we've done to the lamb and recognizing our own sin. Now, do we have to pick between those? Because this is the point. This image sort of takes all of these and pulls them together in a way that it's really hard for us to sort of explain verbally, sequentially. It's all right there in the image of the picture in a way that we struggle with. Now, Isaiah 53 is often referred to with respect to this passage too. And as I read through it, I think you'll begin to see why. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we would desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet out of his generation, yet who out of who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. He was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. 
yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord Tate makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offering and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong. Because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. You see how this takes all these images and folds them together? We are in this world. I think you called me a liar on national TV. Can we be pure? Can we be strong? We, we usually fail in all of this. But one has come, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. We struggle to embody these diverse excellencies. Presidents struggle. Each of us struggles. Sometimes we're too harsh. Sometimes we're too soft. Back and forth we flop. This is very difficult individually. We often approximate it better as a community, collectively. I think this is part of the reason we're called the body of Christ. Now my admonition for you is to study the model. Read the Gospels. Read Jesus. Memorize him. Take him in. Pay careful attention to how, time after time again, he manages to do this. He's, he's unbending, yet merciful. He knows just the way to, to call people to account while being so outrageously gracious and forgiving that others feel it's irresponsible. Learn the ways of the conquering lamb and follow that lamb wherever he goes.